Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Milken Institute for inviting me along for a second year in a row. It can't have all gone too badly wrong last year, so here we are again. Last year, we were, I think we were the only panel with a power cut. Apparently, this year, we're the only panel with uh, two dropouts. It doesn't say anything at all about life in emerging markets. Uh, <laughs> but we do have a small, perfectly formed panel. We're also, I think, the most gender diverse panel of the day as well, which is good. That is, that helped us along. Thank you. <laughs> Sitting next to me is Andrew Newington, partner and chief investment officer at Actis, uh, who manages uh, long-term illiquid assets, five to 15 years and above, 10 to 12 billion. Next to him, we have Gadia Cooper of Bearings, a long-term public equity investor who looks at things over kind of a five-year horizon. And then on the far right is Charles Robertson, who is the chief economist and strategist at Renaissance Capital, who looks at any time scale that customers are interested in, from the very shortest to the very longest. So we've got a range of perspectives on emerging markets and how to de-risk investing in them. So I'm just going to, we're not going to do any opening remarks as such, but I am going to ask each of our panelists to just tell me what, if anything, keeps them awake at night in terms of emerging market risk uh, and what they would immediately like to do about it. So, Andrew, over to you, if you don't mind. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, many things, I think, in the micro keep me awake at night because, you know, we're managing a portfolio of, you know, 65-odd investments and 125,000 people. So... I w often wake up, unfortunately, to learn that something terrible has happened to one of those people or one of those companies. So those sort of things at the micro level. At the macro level, I think, in, in a sense, it's tomorrow's headlines that I worry right. about because headlines have an enormous influence on the confidence people feel in our markets. And that translates both into the prospects that we have to raise capital for investment there, uh, but also the, the way in which our management companies feel about their own businesses, uh, their opportunities, uh, and the way they trade. So I think head headlines and sentiment have a huge impact. And is there anything you can do to mitigate those risks? I think in, in terms of mitigating publicity, no. I mean, this is an example of how you engage to try and explain the story and tell people what's really going on. You know, I think there is a, an awful lot. It's like an ocean. There's an enormous amount of movement and noise and fury at the surface. And then underneath the surface, it's a lot calmer and things change less, uh, less frequently. So our job really is to try and communicate what that means in an emerging market context, how we focus on identifying those assets that are stable that are enjoying the benefit of continued secular growth rather than necessarily being affected by those you know, swings and arrows at the top of the ocean. Okay, good idea. What worries you the most on a day-to-day -day basis? Day-to-day, -day, a, uh, a lot of stuff worries us clearly because obviously you are open to headline risk. You walk into the office not knowing what's going to happen on that particular day because somebody said something that could be the President of the United States, it could be the Fed Chairman, or it could be one of the... Um, one of the leaders of the countries that you are invested in. But what really mitigates it for me is the fact that we are looking at public equity on a company by company basis. Bottom up, we look three to five years um, investment horizon, research horizon, and we actually try and figure out how we can price in all those risks in the required cost of equity that we apply to the companies that we invest in. So we're looking for companies that we have uh, kind of confidence in the way that we are looking at their earnings over the longer period of time. At the same time, we're looking at pricing in those nice secular growth stories in a way that rewards me as an investor for taking the risk out of that particular, um, that particular company. It's not about countries, it's about companies, right. but obviously the macro and the governance of a particular country is very important for us, and we look at ways of pricing in that risk and look at ways of trying to understand what the companies do uh, by having a large research team, by having the ability to go and visit those companies to really understand them and understand the investment opportunity that we have. Okay, let's come into some of the detail of that in a minute. Charlie, what keeps you awake, if anything? Um, well, I'm not really the ideal person to ask. I've, I love risk. Um, so I was, I was in the Soviet <laughs> Union lack of risk then. Um, on, on the day that they tried the coup against Gorbachev in 1991. And my first response was I could sit here and listen to the uh, orchestra playing classical music on the TV, <laughs> or I could go down to the main square and get involved in the demonstration. So I, I, I like risk. Um, but I think you need to quantify it, and you can. So I don't know who was just on the previous panel 
uh, and from the asset manager's side, but I have a new enemy, uh, a guy who's saying he wouldn't invest in emerging markets because of FX risk. Right. Well, we can quantify FX risk, um, and, and we do do that. We have our long-range model, and we say in 2007, EM was super expensive relative to its long-term average of FX. That was a risky time to be investing in emerging markets. Uh, today, emerging market FX ex-China is 5 to 10% cheap to its 25-year average. And you can look at Turkey, which is 30% cheap to that EM average, and say, OK, this is quite an interesting time to be looking at Turkey. Um, on politics, we, we quantify sorry, political sorry, but, as well. But does that mean you've, you've, you've cracked the, you know, the, the key that you can tell what's going to happen? Do those models predict the future as well as I think shows are, how we got there? They are, when there's extreme value on the cheap side, yeah. uh, it's, it's sending us a pretty good signal. Have for, you put that in? I mean, when yeah, did yeah, you laugh? South Africa, you, early 2016, there's 16 to the dollar. The currency had only been cheap that 7% of the time in the last 23 years, that was a good time to be in South Africa. Uh, September this year, when I was on Bloomberg, uh, saying that there was spectacular value uh, in some emerging markets like Turkey. There'd only been one month since 1960 that the Turkish lira was as weak as it was in September. I mean, it's, it wasn't that hard right. to say. Well, it's easy to say <laughs> afterwards, but... Then it goes another leg down. Th 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 <laughs> there's always, there is always that risk, but it's just about quantifying it. Um, and we do it on politics as well. So we did 7,000 data points since 1950. We looked at political change, and we can tell you that in Nigeria's elections next year, there's a 4% chance of something going really badly wrong, like a coup. Uh, there's about a 14% chance in any given year of Zimbabwe having something dramatically going wrong or, or different. Um, and, and sure enough, you're more likely then to see what we saw in Zimbabwe last year than, say, a coup in Nigeria. And you can say it works, yeah? Yeah, no, it's been, it's been pretty helpful for us. So it's, just, it's not saying the risk isn't there, it's there. Uh, but it's just about, about reducing it. Now, we did actually prepare a little bit for this panel. And while we were doing it, Andrew didn't agree entirely with, with some of that, at least. Do you want to... Well, I think it would be wonderful. It would be wonderful if, there, if this model did exist that was going to tell us with absolute accuracy what is going to happen, uh, whether it's in politics or, or elsewhere. I don't know what the odds are that your model would put on Buhari actually genuinely having a clone. Uh, you know, there are these <laughs> events that occur. <laughs> there are these events that occur that are quite difficult to price in. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not convinced that the data set that Charlie has is, is really adequate to be able to predict with that degree of accuracy. Um, I think our view is very much that, you know, the mitigants you've got to look for are those that come with growth. They come through your sectoral choices. You know, where are you going to invest? It's, and, and those sectors, you know, and I talk in this context particularly about power, you know, they are uh, very important strategically to the countries that we invest in, irrespective of which government is running them uh, and, and the like. So you can, you can absorb volatility in the overall macro uh, environment through picking the right sector. Now, you know, as I say, we also have a long-run fair value model to look at currency. Okay. It doesn't tell us where the currency will be in two weeks. What it tells us is where we think the currency sits relative to its long-run value today, which suggests, as Charlie alludes to, that the market is over or underpriced. And we use that when we think about pricing the relative risk of a local currency return versus a dollar return. So it's a very helpful tool, and I'm not for a second suggesting it's not. But it is not the panacea to addressing emerging market risk in our markets. Um, We'd like to uh, keep this as open as possible. We'd not, normally, I think, panels keep questions for towards the end. If there's anything that you want to question or add to as we go along, I'll try and keep looking around the audience. Stick a hand up if you want to say anything at any point from now onwards. There's a, but wait until the microphone comes to you. There's a couple of mics, I think, one either side. Uh, and if you, just, if you do want to ask a question, tell us who you are, because these things are recorded and it won't make sense if you don't. Um, <laughs> nobody... Um, as yet mentioned, in the, on, the, on the top l rung of risks is the thing that I thought was going to be top of mind for a lot of people. It's certainly top of mind for a lot of people that we talk to uh, at the FT, and that's the Fed and what's happening to interest rates and cost of capital and so on. I don't want to... I'm sure the whole conference is talking about this a lot, and I don't want to drag it centre stage. But just in terms of how liquidity and illiquidity of your investments, how the cost of capital changes and impacts on your decision-making. Could you just give us a couple of words on that? 
Yes, I mean, obviously, it influences what you're thinking in terms of the forward performance of the dollar relative to the local currency. So that is the first thing one thinks through. We're not seeing, you know, absolute levels of financing costs in the U.S. suddenly skyrocket. We're talking about ratcheting up by 25 basis points. So it's not revolutionary in that context, but it is a cycle of tightening. Our suspicion is that that will hurt the U.S. consumer more than it hurts the emerging market consumer in the medium term, and so they may well look to reverse that policy, and you can see more dovish commentary coming out of the Fed at the moment. Yeah. So we don't know which direction it will go. Ultimately, as we seek to tap the capital markets for some of our investments, we haven't seen a significant change in appetite. Um, and a lot of those investments clearly are those that benefit from dollar-denominated revenues or income streams. So they have a degree of insulation from that threat anyway. Um, so we, we note the commentary, and I think where you see it most uh, obviously is in FX. Katie? To answer the question um, correctly, we really need to know what is it that you invest in emerging markets for. You invest in emerging markets because you would like to have uh, exposure to companies that give you sustainable growth over the longer period, but because you are an, a dollar investor, you want your return to be commensurate with that kind of risk that you're taking in those emerging markets. For us, the way we do it is, first and foremost, identify those companies that give you that sustainable growth, whether it is because of millennial spend, whether it is because it's IT, whether it is clean energy, whatever it is that is secularly going through those emerging markets, and considering those emerging markets are the majority of the world population, where most of the growth is higher than that of developed markets. And then you want to actually quantify that investment opportunity as a dollar investor. For us, that means identifying the loss of, um, of purchasing power parity relative to the dollar over the time horizon that we are investing in, which in, this particular case, in our particular case, we look at least five years. And then on top of that, we ask ourselves, what sort of extra you want to actually require from your investment on top of that in order to be happy that if the Fed tightens and if your, human, uh, if your capital becomes harder to get in dollar terms, how much do you actually need to be paid on top of that in order to be able to uh, put your money in that investment? What did you call it, sleep at night? <laughs> so for us, that meant that we have to also identify the economic risk of a particular country. It's also um, looking at dislocations, the one-off events that could happen and what the chances of them happening and when they happen, are they priced in, are they not priced in? And most importantly, also look at the business model of every single company we invest in to look whether those companies can give you that return in excess of your cost of capital that is currently tightening. On top of that, we also look at ESG factors because we found that companies that look after ESG, improve governance, are actually the ones that the market rewards. They give you a higher rate of return as an investor, and that's the way we look at it. So the Fed tightening is just one of the factors that we look at it clearly deteriorates the um, easy money um, period that we've had, but it's not the be-all and end-all. You do have business models, you have growth, you have cost structures that you can actually mitigate some of that FX risk um, or tightening. Charlie, close to around the Fed or not? Um, I very rarely try and second-guess all the experts who, who know it very well. Um, <laughs> what I would say is that a few years ago with the QE-type policies, the cost of risk didn't look right to me. Uh, I found it extremely hard to be positive about African Eurobonds, sub-Saharan Eurobonds when they're yielding 6% a, a few years ago. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Africa. I think the education story has completely changed the continent, and we're going to see that over the next 10, 20 years. However, 6% yield on some dollar Eurobonds was not reflecting the underlying 35. risk. And <laughs> 35 years. It's now, it's now gone back back up. So we're at 9% yield on, on a Nigeria euro bond that came out a week or two ago. And that is a more appropriate level. So I think uh, we're back to more normal and sensible levels now. Okay, let's talk about some of the factors then determining whether you're investing over the long term or not. Uh, one of the things I think all of you mentioned when we, when we were talking beforehand was education. To what extent does it matter? Charlie, I know that's a theme of yours. So perhaps you can go first on that one. I got Every Africa conference you ever go to, someone says, are the robots going to take our jobs or African jobs? There will be no jobs in Africa. There's going to be a problem. There's 2 billion people in 2050, and what's going to happen? So I went into the library to try and find out about this stuff and, and what, whether we've had this issue before. And at one level, you know we haven't. There's, there's more jobs in the world today, more people employed today than there's ever been, and we are the most robotized 
economy we've ever been in. What I found far more interesting was the thing about education. Uh, and, and this theory, which a woman called Mary Ann Bowman had done in the 1960s, said, if you haven't got 40% adult literacy, you cannot grow sustainably. It's amazing. So I checked the data, and you know, those countries are all in the Sahel region. And I went to talk to the US Army about this uh, a few weeks ago. And, and they were saying, ah, we have the same problem in Afghanistan. And I said, yes. And that's why you still have a problem in Afghanistan 20 years after you first got involved, nearly 20 years. If you've got over 70% adult literacy, you can industrialize. And you can check the data. This goes back 200 years. But you can go and check the data, and it is still true. So which countries are industrializing or have done so? It's the East Asians. Which countries can do so in the next five to 10 years? It's North Africa. Um, and sometime through the 2020s, you're going to see that in, in Sub-Sahara. And then you start to get the 7 8 9% growth that you're getting in India. India got over that 70% threshold for adult literacy in 2015. India is 25 years behind China. China industrialized first because it had adult literacy first. That's communism for you. And 25 years later, you then get India about to do the same. Huge pollution cost for the world, which is a slight risk. But it's, uh, it's the education thing is absolutely fundamental. I'm going to take it one level further. So you're talking about primary and literacy rates. I'm going to talk about sort of being ready for the economy that we are having at the moment, i.e. the digital economy. And if you look at emerging markets, part of the um, work that we have done in terms of identifying whether we can sustainably grow in emerging markets is human capital. And I actually, I, I'm a physicist, that's where I started from. I wanted to look at STEM graduates in different parts of the world and looked at the percentage of STEM graduates in emerging economies versus the developed world. China graduates 4.7 million STEM graduates every year. The United States graduates 0.47. India graduates 2.5 million. One of the largest that graduates actually are em uh, emerging markets uh, countries. We're talking about Iran, for example. So what we are talking about here is the fact that the economies in emerging markets are investing in primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, maybe even including women in the workforce, etc. But most importantly, they're leapfrogging they are trying to get the sort of skill set that we need in order to grow in emerging markets going forward. Not only that, if you look at other kind of factors that you would look at, which are on the side of just looking at education in, as an education literacy rate, improvement in workforce, etc., and you look at things like investment in R&D as a percentage of GDP, whereas the United States have been spending large 2 3% of um, GDP Europe actually lower. China, in the last, since the last 2000, really, have actually gone now to the level of the European Union in terms of spending, in terms of R&D uh, spend as a percentage of GDP. Emerging economies have started educating and educating properly, properly for, since 2000. We are talking about now reaping, reaping the benefits of that um, going forward. And for me, that's a very important factor in thinking about emerging economies leapfrogging and where I invest and what I want to invest in. I want to invest in the digital economy. I want to invest in millennials. I want to invest in changing consumption in emerging economies compared to developed economies. I want to be able to, to identify that, that I can do that sustainably, and that's human capital and that's education. Andrew, you, you're, I think you said you're the world's biggest investor in renewable energy, massive solar farms with very few moving parts. Um, does education matter for that? I mean, that's, this is a capital-intensive thing, isn't it? Education matters everywhere. Um, it is the building block of growth in an economy. You know, the two, two factors that we regard as being fundamental to long-term sustainable growth are population and productivity. And without the second, without productivity, which is driven ultimately by education, you will not have sustainable growth. So I completely, it's wonderful to hear the statistics that Charlie was using because I think they do capture the nature of both the challenge but also the opportunity uh, that lies in front of us. And independently of, of what asset you happen to invest in, you take energy as an example, yes, it's true, a solar plant doesn't require that many people to operate. So it's not about necessarily educating the operators, but it requires a huge amount of policy to be implemented to enable that to take place. It requires the investment in infrastructure to move that power from wherever it's generated to wherever it's used. 
and it requires you know, the growth of a consumption economy that demands incremental power going forward. So all of those factors require education. I think the big challenge I see in many of the markets which, in which we operate, and I think as you allude to, China and India have been most successful here, is how do you successfully deliver that? Because education isn't the only answer. You have to come up with solutions to female emancipation in a lot of these countries where that stands firmly in the path of a proper spread of an education system. We invest heavily in tertiary education in Africa. Why do we invest in tertiary? Because primary and secondary are not really accessible because they continue to be dominated largely by the public sector, and most of the people in the public sector consider that to be an aid-related investment that's required, mm. whereas we firmly believe that is a private sector role to play alongside the public sector in improving the quality of that education. In South Africa, we've recently invested in two businesses that provide distance learning, distance learning in tertiary for business students around the continent. The ability to take that curriculum and deliver it across the continent at a cost to the student of one to two thousand dollars a year is revolutionary. Take that same approach and apply it in primary and secondary and give them curricula that are developed for their needs and developed remotely and delivered remotely and all of a sudden you start to see transformation. And that's not fundamentally something the public sector is well positioned to do. Right. That's a private sector approach and it needs to be done in partnership. And there's demand for that. The, the, the population is, is that's, that's on their priority list. Immense demand. There is greater demand there than there is in the UK. Okay, in the UK, every parent wants their child to be well educated, but they sit back and they make a choice between private and public, and they, broadly speaking, are, are content, maybe not happy, but content with the outcomes. In, in our markets, people can't get access. That's the starting point. There's no fallback. They can't get access. And then quality becomes a key thing. And if you, if you do a survey of people around our markets, and we do this regularly, and you ask them, what is the most important thing you spend money on? The answer will not be their mobile phone, surprisingly. It'll be their children's education. Right. Yeah. That's what they want to spend money on. So there's a huge demand out may there. I, may I add just to this one point? The reason for that is that they can see the value of that yeah. education. That education actually gives you economic value. So the more educated you are, the more you get better jobs, you become richer than your parents, and you become the main provider for the family. So they can, there is actually literally a link between yeah. education and return. Yeah. Uh, can we have a microphone? We have a first question over here raising a hand, which I'm delighted to see. Encourage everybody else to follow suit. And we have another one coming up shortly afterwards. Hi there. Uh, great panel. Thank you. Uh, did you sorry, uh, did, did, you, did you identify yourself? I just missed Sorry. It. Andrew Fairbairn, SEO London. Uh, <laughs> I'm the CEO. Um, I have a question just about uh, <laughs> the, uh, the size of market uh, that you engage in as a factor in risk. So we can talk about developed markets, emerging markets, frontier markets, and then maybe even forgotten markets. So we have a place like, uh, you know, Guatemala has a stock exchange. Uh, Jamaica has a stock exchange. Malawi has a stock exchange. At what point do these markets get to be big enough and robust enough <coughs> to be counted as worthy of investment uh, from a risk perspective? And do you have a sense of, can you quantify or, or, uh, or in qualitative terms, Talk about what those steps are up that ladder. I, I would put that one first to Charlie. You know? Yeah, I, it's, it comes up a lot because we, um, we don't call them forgotten. We call them beyond frontier, to be polite. Um, but we do have that same issue. So I'm trying to get people to look at Ghana now because it's really interesting government doing some, some quite cool stuff. But $100,000 a day turnover. It's just like people really are not going to get involved. I think you've got to get at least $1 or $2 million. And then that's for our really focused frontier funds who've only got a couple of hundred million dollars under management, they might be prepared to get involved in a market with one to two million dollars a day. But anything less, and it's a bit chicken and egg, until people start to put money in, you don't get the liquidity, and then the, you don't have the liquidity, so people won't put the money in. So government privatization programs can play a role. Kazakhstan's trying to do it right now to try and get a little bit more interest in their market. Um, so privatization helps. Local pension fund, Setups help, and a lot of sub-Saharan countries have got that, to, to many people's surprise. So, so the money's potentially there, but it's easier to just buy government bonds, which is what most of them do most of the time. So it, it's, you, you need a government who wants to do this, who's prepared to privatise, uh, and then an openness to foreign, to foreign involvement as well. Andrew, what about the private equity side? Uh, no market is too small. I think, put simply. Um, what is important is the sector you're investing in. So we used to run the ele electricity distribution business in Guatemala for the entire country. So you know, that is a sizable business. Uh, 
And we were able, I think, in six years of ownership, really to fundamentally transform the way in which that business operated, bringing greater efficiency, far more connections in the business. And we ultimately sold it to a group of local entrepreneurs. We did the same in Uganda and ultimately then floated the electric electricity distribution business there, Umeme, on the stock exchange, which contributes a very significant proportion, as you can imagine, of the market capitalization of the entire exchange. So this thing is a, it's a process. Uh, and even countries like Malawi and others that are smaller, you know, the first thing that happens is not going to be the development of a, a hugely liquid stock exchange. The first thing that happens is going to be the investment by international companies in Malawi to build their businesses locally, to capitalize on the consumption growth, uh, and ultimately that will be reflected in their stock exchange pricing wherever they happen to be listed. And then private companies follow behind, and in time those companies form parts of a domestic exchange, but it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but no company, no country rather, is too small provided you're in the right sector. You must have a lower limit yeah, on what you can invest in. Oh, well, let me just actually sort of conceptually talk about why stock exchanges matter. Okay. Stock exchanges matter because it's one way of raising assets, raising capital for companies to invest and actually to grow. And, and for that to happen, you have to have a lot of um, factors that makes it interesting for an uh, external fund manager who's dealing in public equity to go into that particular market. Usually it's the investment case of the particular country, it wanting to be better in terms of governance, but usually it's the fact that it wants to provide public pension schemes, and those public pension schemes want to have income, and, and therefore they want to have a proper working um, stock market that allows you to be able to invest and do all of, all of the correct things, which means you also need codes, you need laws that work, you need governance in that particular country that allows you to be able to do that. Now, the fact that there are some stock markets that have all of that and are forgotten beyond frontiers <laughs> um, just tells you that um, it, it, they are just basically there in waiting. Just don't forget, there are some markets which are extremely um, well connected for their local speculators, investors, etc., that have no you can't see them as an emerging market investor or a beyond emerging markets, Saudi being one example, example that is now becoming talked about more and more. But for, for us, we do have liquidity limits because I am, risk, I am investing on behalf of my clients. My clients ask me to give them risk-adjusted returns. Liquidity is one way of um, me controlling risk, the risk in emerging markets. But I also have a dedicated frontier funds that looks for those opportunities beyond frontiers that, uh, that is there for the long term, which what it looks for is improvement in governance, improving in laws, looking at um, what, is, what is the country, but also the companies in that particular country are doing to de-risk themselves. Kenya is a great example of that. Some companies in there that have leapfrogging technology, mobile technology that allows you to do payments. And PESA was one of those um, companies that look amazing whichever way you look at it. So you just have to be an active investor that looks for those particular um, investments. Hands are going up. The, the next one up was right here <laughs> with the red band. Um, thank you. Uh, another question. Sorry, would you mind identifying yourself? Sorry, my name is Walter Lamberson from Bronfman LLC. Uh, and my question's around public markets in, in emerging markets. Uh, and I guess it's easiest to start with a provocation, which is it's my observation that many equity managers who invest in emerging markets, outcomes are determined not by their stock picking within a given market, but broadly their market exposure. Uh, you know, if you were long Nigeria versus long Turkey, your experiences over the last like five years may be very different, but how important is it to pick the right, the right bank in Nigeria or the right bank okay. in, in Kenya? Um, and, and I guess my questions are, the concerns I would have are start with you know, the, the quality of, of, of auditing, how the reliability of, of you know, fi public financials down to concerns over insider trading, things like that. Um, dissuade me of that. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that one because we do public equity. Um, actually, um, if you want to really pick an equity manager, what I would urge everybody to do is to look at the return of that equity manager to see how much of it comes from stock picking, how much of the risk of the portfolio is being taken by taking risk in companies and how much of it is inadvertent, taking risk because of factor risk. Our process not only allows you to be completely agnostic about the emerging markets that you are invested in, that the actual um, companies that you invested in, you're not bound by any index, 
you, when you actually build portfolios, you're building portfolios to maximize the risk that comes from taking company risk and minimize factor risk that comes from things like volatility or currency or um, US Feds going up or whatever it is. I can prove to you that in our emerging markets um, investments, all of the risk is, well, actually three quarters of risk always comes from stock selection because you will always have covariance matrices, you will always have correlations that to do with real problems, real um, cost of equity, etc. But most, all of the return comes from that stock selection and not from taking these particular beta plays. For me, that is also the difference between active investing and passive investing. Clearly, if you want to have exposure to a market because you have a view about where the market is going, directly going, then you go for the cheapest exposure for that. That is really not what we do. What we do is we invest in an emerging company. The idea is to extract alpha, not beta, for that particular market by actually looking company by company, taking the risk from investing in the companies, minimizing unintended consequences when we look at building portfolios because what we seek is lower risk adjusted return. What we want is to have a proper risk adjusted return for our clients over a cycle. We actively minimize that. Sorry, do you want to come in? Sir? Well, I only just wanted to say I, I wish it was all country focused um, because uh, the guy <laughs> sits next to me at work is an equity strategist and, and our bonuses vary between the two of us as to who's right. So I think it's all top down. He thinks it's all bottom up. Um, <laughs> What I would say is, if you look at a place like Russia, no one ever says to me, spare bank, VTB, no difference between the two. Uh, you know, there is, if you go to Nigeria, everyone knows that GTB bank is particularly good, or in Turkey, guarantee bank is... Anyway, I keep on hearing about the stock side, so I unfortunately have to back what you're saying. Thank you. <laughs> uh, gentleman over here with the hand up. And then we'll come over here for another microphone here at the back. Richard Evans, uh, just a private investor. Can I ask you... When the next downturn comes in developed markets and all the things we heard about in the first plenary session, whether it's trade wars escalating, whether it's a euro crisis with Italy, Brexit, whatever, when it comes, how will it be different for emerging market valuations this time compared to 10 years ago, 08, 09? Will it be basically the same? Everything will go down? together? Will everybody be risk averse and the thinness of emerging markets? Will it be worse because we're more connected? Or will it be less this time? Um, and I'm not talking about your three to five year views. I'm not saying the companies will go bust. I'm talking about the valuations. Mm -hmm. Is it just going to be a replay of 10 years ago, really, with a little bit of twerking? Shall I take that? Please. Um, usually what happens when you have shocks, which is what you are explaining, is that all assets become more correlated. It's just the way it is because you're pricing risk of each other and what you have is that actually I'm not going to tell you that when you have a massive shock that emerging markets will not go down with developed markets of course they will the question is whether you as an investor would be able to be in the companies that will not actually bail out on you so in 2008 for example you got valuations which were point for a book of that of um, compared um, to developed markets you actually really got assets very cheaply. We are now in a situation where you can get emerging markets very cheaply, but I wasn't going to be here and come and tell you you're going to buy emerging markets now because actually you've just had a lot of shocks and the valuations look really attractive. What I'm going to tell you is that from when I've been looking at emerging markets all my investment life, I started by being a Middle Eastern in, uh, analyst and then I did Russia for a long time. There were golden years in Russia, by the way. It wasn't all just bad. And then actually during all that time, I realized that regardless of what you, um, what you think about particular companies, the assets couple, and you just get those particular companies, still the good companies, cheaper. If you look at the, um, however, the longer term about how emerging markets were, even where they were in 2008 till now, and maybe Charlie can talk more about that, if you look at the financing of those particular countries, the dependence on external capital in order to be able to sustainably grow, that has changed massively in the last decade or so. We don't have so many emerging markets that have massive can, can deficits that reliant on foreign capital. What we have is still sentiment. When um, the, the most vulnerable were Turkey and Argentina, both of them blew up this year. But actually, if you look sustainably uh, at emerging markets, we have 
the most millennials in the world sit there, the most improvement in terms of um, middle class sit there, the uh, nicest secular stories going forward either sit there or sit in developed markets and they're equally well. This is digitization, this is the Tencents of this world, the Alibabas of this world, Ecomex, TSMC being the best um, semiconductor foundry in the world. They are seen emerging markets. And those companies can become cheaper over a short term, <laughs> i.e. the couple, but it is my job is to in, in, ensure that these are the companies that are sitting in the portfolios because they will recover the most and they will give you that excess return. Yes, please. Just a, just a quick one. I'm not a public markets investor, but I observe that after 2008, what happened was that two things attracted premium valuation, yield and growth. And if you're looking for uh, a market that will recover from whatever the undoubted correlated decline will be fastest, it'll be those that show those two characteristics or the companies within those markets that demonstrate those characteristics. And if you think about growth as probably the more important in the long term, you know, that is an emerging market story. And we use this word emerging markets to capture what is now 6 billion of the world's 7 billion population, 7 billion plus. It's 95% of the world's people under 30. Within 15 years, it'll be 90% of the world's population. You know, this is where the growth is coming from, however you choose to play that. Um, I was sitting on a panel, or were listening actually to a panel in the Singapore version of this event, and uh, David Bonderman was on the panel talking about one of his companies that sold uh, non-woven fabrics. And uh, non-woven fabrics, for those of you who don't know, used in making diapers. And they were selling more in Japan for use in adult incontinence pants than they were for baby diapers. And that gives you a sense of the challenge that the developed world faces purely on demographics. So if you're thinking about growth as a driver of valuation post some form of ap apocalyptic, hopefully not apocalyptic, but financial crisis coming through, I think that's where you've got to look. There's also, um, a, surely we've seen a change in the degree of correlation between emerging markets. If you think back to the previous wave of, of um, crises in the 90s, where you know Asia set off Russia, which set off Latin America, Charlie, we're not, are we getting that? I mean, what, what happened this year? Was it Argentina and Turkey upsetting everybody? Or was contagion not what it was? No, I would just think EM's just not where it was. Um, so in 07, 08, we had this fantastic credit boom going on and a whole load of Eastern Europe uh, were countries I followed very closely and oil prices were really high. Um, so the bank I work for, Renaissance Capital, was people were comparing it to be the Goldman Sachs of, in emerging markets. And that's when Golden, Goldman Sachs in emerging markets was a good thing. <laughs> uh, so, and we were worth a lot of money, and sadly we're not worth such a lot of money anymore. So we haven't got as far to fall in EM. Um, do you want to be in EM if the US is going to take a dive? No, you just want to be in US Treasuries. Um, if you are going to be in EM, you just want to be in South Africa, because they've got pension funds worth 100% of GDP, and they keep the valuations up. Um, I just think they're not likely to fall like they did last time. It's not, they just haven't got as far to fall, um, and they're already a bit cheap. I had a question over here. Yep, microphone right behind you. Very cheap. Thank you. Hello, Aubrey Ruby, uh, founder of Africa Expert Network. Charlie, my uh, question's for you, and we all know experts are terrible at predictions, so uh, I'll ask you to predict anyway. Uh, looking at 2019, which uh, sectors and countries or markets are you most uh, bullish about? And where do you think that people will get the risks wrong? She's the fund manager. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, this question is yours. But your advice doesn't necessarily move money, so we'll ask you. Oh, first. I find it really tough. So some of the markets I look at most, I look at Russia and Turkey and South Africa, and there's not an awful lot of change going on in Russia, and there's not an awful lot of positive change in Turkey, really, leaving aside a little bit of currency opportunity. Um, South Africa, maybe. Maybe Ramaphosa does a little bit of, of reform after the May elections. That could be helpful. Um, maybe Nigeria has a little bit of an upside. I mean, no one's looking at Africa right now because for good reason. Because growth in the two biggest economies has been 1% to 2% in the last two, three, four years now. 1% to 2% in the two biggest economies that make up one third of Africa's GDP. Why would you invest in the continent when you can get 7 to 8% growth in India? I totally understand why people have made that choice. But with the change of, of politics in South Africa, with a change perhaps in the February elections in Nigeria, it could, that could be interesting. Um, and then there's a little bit of talk. Um, well, I, it's India, you know, long run. Again, you've got an election story. That, that, I do like that long-term story as well. But people are overweight. Um, and I understand people have got bullish on Brazil too. But I'm going to really <laughs> quickly hand this over to you. Uh, it's very easy for us. We look company per company to see which are the companies that you would like to be able to, that you would 
sleep at night is the wrong word, but where you will get excess returns over your cost of equity. The way the world looks uh, to us at the moment is that you have a lot of disruption happening in the world. I mean, you talked about robotics a little bit, and that's only a little bit of the disruption happening. The whole digitization, um, the whole requirements that are, the, all the changes that are happening in emerging markets, and actually the whole world, implies that you really need to understand where you would get excess return for taking the cost, for taking the risk of I investing in those particular economies. I talked a little bit about sort of STEM and education. There's a reason for that. Um, I think there's going to be changes that are irreversible. I think we're going to go and talk more about uh, AI as a disruptor. We're going to talk about move to e-commerce versus, uh, versus traditional retail. We're going to talk about going, moving into cleaner energy, cleaner water, better education. We're also talking about the fact that millennials are really uh, a phenomena that uh, is very, um, if you like, very strong in its purchasing power, in its demand for what it wants, in the way that it will invest in its own future going forward. And these millennials actually sit in emerging markets. They sit in China. They sit in India, the, in Indonesia. The size of the millennial um, population is 35% uh, of the world workforce. And they're getting richer, and they know what they want. What, what do they invest in? They invest in insurance products. They, they go traveling. Uh, so it's tourism. They, they um, want to be entertained differently. So what does it mean in terms of social media and e-commerce? And we just look for companies that will take. It's easier to invest in companies that have got that kind of weight behind them, where, where the investment case gets helped by the fact that there's that secular demand. And that's where we look. Clean energy electric vehicles, you know, all of the things that everybody talks about, we just find them in emerging markets. Just, just an observation again. I mean, I think that the problem in emerging markets, stock markets, is by and large they're thin and narrow. They're not broad and diversified and deep. And so as a consequence, there's a supply-demand equation that factors in on pricing of assets. So where it's an imperfect way, it may be the only way you have as investors, but it's an imperfect way through which to access the growth that's available there. But it is what it is. Uh, and so pick carefully. And I think in the, that context, you know, I have the sectors I think are the most exciting, fintech and financial services. Uh, you don't have barriers to adoption of new technology typically in our markets, and so it simply moves at a pace that nobody really who doesn't live there can appreciate. Mm -hmm. And mobile money in Africa, with 21% of people now holding mobile money accounts across the continent, the biggest mobile money in the world, of course driven by M-Pesa, but also you know, across the entire continent. Uh, you're seeing scale of adoption that is extraordinary. We're doing the same in India. 900 million people coming into a biometric in identification system within, the, within two years. You know, that is extraordinary. These are changes that are fundamental in those markets. And so that's where I'd be looking. But as I say, you have a, an issue more broadly. The microphone down here at the front, please. There's a lot of people queuing up for questions, so let's try and keep them snappy and moving along. And then one over here, lady in the leopard print. Yes, thank you. I'm Dietrich Heitman. I'm with GTI's partners. Among other things, we've invested a couple of billion dollars in the property markets in Brazil. Uh, I'm surprised that we're already spending an hour on emerging market, and Brazil hasn't even been mentioned with one syllable from any of you. So my question was, where are you in Brazil? Have you wiped it out of your universe or like what's your views on Brazil it come out of a deep crisis you know but we've you know solved a lot of issues and there has been a, an election that at least you know even if people aren't necessarily happy with the outcome but at least it removed the political uncertainties uh, some sorts on Brazil do you want a, a private market perspective Brazil is one of our largest countries that we invest in yeah. um, you know close to 200 million people now uh, and uh, obviously coming out of a very difficult period, a consumer recession really that's lasted for three or four years now, and a lack of confidence engendered by the, the Lavo Jato scandal and by all of the changes in politics that we've seen. And I think, you know, we won't talk here today, I suspect, about Bolsonaro's policies, uh, but some of his initial decisions, certainly in the makeup of his cabinet, are giving us a degree of confidence uh, that there is a policy of continuation of some of the policies that were adopted economically in the Temer regime. So um, there has certainly on the ground been a resumption of confidence, uh, and that's reflected in our ability to continue to trade our assets. We've recently closed a, a sale of a very significant business there, which wouldn't have been possible had there not been that confidence from the incoming investor in, in the quality of the economy. And we listed very recently one of our fintech businesses businesses in NASDAQ, uh, a business called Stone, which is entirely reliant on the business in Brazil. It doesn't have a market outside Brazil. 
uh, and that business uh, initial market capitalization was north of $6 billion. So it gives you a sense for the level of interest there is in the consumer economy there. So I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm bullish on the currency. I think where it sits right now, it's probably actually overvalued relative to long run. Uh, but I am, you know, fragile optimism around the resumption of some level of continuity in policy. Can we keep it moving with a question over here? Uh, lady with the hand up there. Um, hello, my name is Funda Ahan. I'm from CapConnect. Um, we work primarily in the family office space, and with that I have a, a, a private markets question um, for the gentleman from Actis. Um, one of the clear shifts and trends that we have seen in family offices with their emerging market exposures in the last five years is that they've gone from public equities preference to private equity. Uh, not all, but some of that money is shifting long dated. Um, and with that, you've alluded to some of the sectors, but I'd wonder if you could give us a bit more of an overview of really, uh, you know, the, the, the duration of maybe five to ten years, what sectors and maybe which countries you think are going to drive that growth for those investors that perhaps don't need the liquidity but minded to, to have their money locked up for five to ten years. Thank you. Uh, by all means. I mean, I think, you know, I've alluded to some of those sectors already, and it's those where fundamentally there's an imbalance between supply and demand and where you're supplying uh, for into, a, into a market that simply requires more and more of your product. Electricity and power is the most obvious of those. That is the fundamental ingredient alongside education to economic growth in most of these markets, and the demand is huge. And with the reduction in the cost of renewable power, you can now deliver that power at a marginal cost, which is below the fossil fuel equivalent. And that gives the country in question economic independence and energy independence, and obviously enough, it, it boosts the economy very significantly through that investment. So I think increasingly power and energy remain a sector to be focused on and I do mean electricity not oil and gas that's a different business altogether um, I think then you've got other sectors which are less obviously investable but nonetheless very exciting so education as a sector is very small in terms of what you can find to invest in but immensely exciting in what's happening there and that's really only accessible through private market investment today there's one or two public companies but they are really in the in the minority I think financial services I've already alluded to. And here I'm not really talking about banks. Many of our markets, ironically, uh, although individual consumers are unbanked, the markets are overbanked. So there was a proliferation of very small banks that grew up across Africa. Uh, I was talking about Ghana with a colleague the other day. There are 35 banks in Ghana. You know, you don't need 35 banks in Ghana. You probably need three or four. So you've got a level of consolidation in the industry that has to come through before that part of the sector is really, truly investable at scale. Uh, but fintech and the adoption of financial technologies for the movement of money. I mean, money is, after electricity, the world's biggest commodity. And, and what do we do with it in, in California is the same as what we do with it in Accra. So we move it, we want someone to look after it, we want it to be invested well, we want it to generate returns, we want to be able to give it to our friends safely, we don't want to pay too many fees. It's all the same set of considerations that we would have sitting here in London, are the same, same ones you would have in Sao Paulo. So that is, I think, a phenomenally exciting sector as well. And there, there really are significant investable opportunities of scale. So, you know, those are perhaps energy and financial services, the two that I would focus on most. Uh, right here, please. Yep. Hi, Gina Sanchez, Los Angeles County Retirement Employee Association. Um, one of the things that you so far haven't mentioned, particularly with regards to private investment, um, is choice of operator, or sort of your, your partner on the ground. And when we think of emerging markets, we think of very highly idiosyncratic risks which can also mean that you can, and it is within your power to significantly de-risk an investment mm -hmm. through choice of partner, through choice of operating partner, whether it's a sovereign wealth fund, if you're co-investing alongside sort of partners that have access to resources like land, et cetera. So talk a little bit about that sort of in terms of the context of how much it can de-risk an investment. To you again, I think. Andrew. Is it me again? Okay. Uh, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to hone in on that. And when uh, Jonathan started the panel by asking what keeps you awake at night, I said it's waking up in the morning to discover something terrible has happened to one of our people or one of our companies. And that terrible thing can sometimes be a misalignment with a management team, a founder, a promoter, or a sponsor, which results in some breakage of the relationship. And, and ultimately, that can also be caused by fraud. Uh, and so that is a significant risk, not just in emerging markets, of course. I mean, in developed markets as well, we've seen plenty of instances. But in our markets, it's something we're very focused on. And across our business, we try to do as much as we can through established operating relationships that have, if you like, survived the test of time. Uh, 
They've been through one iteration or two iterations or three iterations. And that could be with a corporate partner. It could be with a governmental partner or a public sector entity. It could be with a management team, a CEO or a CFO who's moved between multiple of our portfolio companies. And we just find that's a great way in which to mitigate risk. The other thing that mitigates risk is to move away from generalist spray and pray investing and instead to focus on sectors you really know. Go narrow, go deep, understand the nature of the people you're dealing with and the challenges they face. And that's the best mitigant. Technically, every single one of our investments, before it ever comes to my desk, goes through a counterparty risk assessment. Okay? And the people at Control Risks and Hacklet and all these various organizations make a fortune from us. But it's money very well spent. Very well spent. Because when you've got a problem with alignment with your partner, you're not going to rescue it, independently of how good the business is. And do you want to check on so on public equity, it's actually the same thing. When we look at companies, we actually look at companies. We do not, we do not just like a concept or look at a company because it happens to be in pharmaceuticals and everybody's getting diabetes and let's go and buy that particular company. It doesn't, it's not enough just to have that kind of tailwind when you're looking at a company. You really need to look at the management of the company. You need to look at... Um, what they do in terms of looking after their supply chains, their employees, the accidents that they're having in their factories, the sort of social impact of what they're doing, the kind of po uh, policies that they look after in order to make sure that, we, as a minority shareholder, I'm protected. We do all of this assessment as part of us looking at how can I get access to that idiosyncratic risk that you talked about in a way that is methodical and where I can actually go and visit those companies and ask those questions of management and demand answers because as a minority shareholder, I'm a shareholder of that asset. And I would quite like to see that return commensurate with that asset, but I need, really need to underwrite every single company. We, uh, right here then, go on, please. Hello, uh, my name is Spiros Pulios, uh, Asia Investment Office. Uh, in our experience investing in these markets, when the downturn comes, the bear market comes, you know, capital just vanishes from the markets overnight. People like Actis are like the only people left. Um, <laughs> how do you, um, I wanna ask a specific question as it relates to the coming bear market. What do you think about it? How do you um, deal with it in terms of your portfolio? How do you underwrite your new investments? Um. I think it helps, as you say, to have a long-term view and be committed to these markets through cycles. And what you're describing, if a bear market comes through, is, of course, a tremendous buying opportunity if you're long. So, you know, we, and we look at it very much in that way. Uh, when capital deserts us, and it does happen from time to time in certain of our markets, not all by any means, but certain of the markets which are thinner, uh, you, you simply have to be patient and bide your time. The other thing that doesn't exist in emerging markets that we do see in the US and, and the Europe is here, markets respond very quickly. They repriced very quickly, liquidity reverts. There are specialist investors who come in to pick up assets at distressed values. By and large, none of that exists across our markets. So you don't have that sort of liquidity buffer, if you like, that comes in the form of those special situations funds. So you have to be patient. But the reality is they also, those markets, take longer to recover that liquidity. Uh, so, you know, the opportunity to buy in that cycle is more protracted than it might otherwise be. Uh, clearly, you want to be on the right side of the cycle. So in an ideal world, if you think you're heading into a bear market today, you want to be very light portfolio companies. But we have been exiting, you know, fairly extensively over the last 18 months. But I have to say that's mostly because the companies in question were ready to exit rather than because we were taking a forward view on, on the development of our markets. Because there's no problem in, in almost everywhere we invest, we're not seeing fundamental issues in the underlying economies of the type that would typically drive bear market conditions. So if there is a bear market condition, it's a result of people feeling very uncomfortable about valuations in US and Europe, which I share that discomfort, mm -hmm. but not fundamentally a reflection on the underlying economic conditions in our markets. Charlie? I was just going to add in a last little anecdote about the unexpected risks you can't quite get. Um, I took my 12-year-old daughter down to Zimbabwe the other day, a couple of weeks ago, and we went to the Victoria Falls. And the Victoria Falls, you can sit in a pool, which is about here, and here's the edge of the falls. And uh, you can put your hand over, and the guy <laughs> takes a fantastic photo. And of course, I'd done all the risk assessment. I mean, was there any risk she was going to fall over and die? No, none. And uh, it was great, absolutely fantastic. And the unquantifiable risk was 
when I then sent that photo to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> One last Good. thing just for, from us, um, <laughs> asking about disappearing, um, disappearing in emerging markets. We've been investors in emerging markets for decades. We are absolutely um, very committed to investing in emerging markets. We put assets in emerging markets. Half of our researchers are in emerging markets. It is not something that we are looking at lightly or we're doing it because it's fashionable or fad. We really do believe in the uh, emerging markets growth story. So for us, it is not sort of Cut and run. And it's all about keeping the family happy as well as Charles mm -hmm. says. Um, well, that has just, that is just uh, <laughs> sw swept by us and our time is up. Um, so thank you all very much, audience, for doing my job for me and coming up with some great questions. Uh, do use the social media. I've been asked to tell you. Is it up there? No, it's not. Only I can see it. Continue the conversation online at Milken Institute and at hashtag MIGlobal. Uh, do tweet about the event and do enjoy the rest of it. Thank you all very much. <laughs>